So welcome. Uh, today, we are delighted to have Ramesh Raskar with us um, for a webinar on strategies for building viable AI ventures. So we're really excited to hear him talk about his expertise in this area. This is our second in our webinar series of Living with AI. Uh, I think many of you were able to join us for uh, our webinar last month with Cynthia Brazil um, on this Living with AI series. So this is our agenda for today. Um, we'll get started with a brief introduction by me uh, and then uh, me and Anna, my, my colleague here joining us from Brazil. Uh, and then we will uh, have, uh, Ramesh will, will present with us for about 45 minutes to an hour. And then we'll have a brief Q&A with him at the end. Uh, the goal for the Q&A is to be as interactive as possible. So please raise your hand, type questions in the chat. Um, ask questions in the Q&A box. Um, we're really excited to answer all the questions you have for Ramesh and for us. And our last slide before we get started, um, we wanted to share, as many of you are members of our MIT Bootcamps graduate community, uh, we wanted to share a couple things that are, are coming up on the docket. So um, your engagement makes this possible. So our webinar series is something that we're really excited about, and this is our first one. And by engaging with us over the last couple of months, your engagement here makes, makes um, it possible for us to run webinar series like this. So we wanted to share about our two upcoming programs. So we'll have our Venture Advancement Program uh, at MIT this spring. This will be our second run of the Venture Advancement Program. Um, this is for entrepreneurs who are looking to launch and or scale their venture. So you'll be working on your own program or your, excuse me, your own, uh, your own venture, and you'll be um, working on all of the things, you know, all of the specific problems that you have launching or scaling your venture. Um, unlike our Innovation Leadership Bootcamp, which is this next program down here, um, you will where you'll be working on a team, the Venture Advancement Program is when you work on uh, your, you know, work with mentors and work on this in more of a one-on-one -on -one environment. Um, our Innovation Leadership Bootcamp will be taking place in Zagreb, Croatia. Uh, this program is for aspiring entrepreneurs and um, applications will open very soon. This is sort of our bread and butter uh, program and where you'll be working on teams for one week and you will build a venture from the ground up. So we are very, very excited um, to be back to in-person boot camps and particularly uh, very excited to be in Croatia in June. So I'll post all the links in the chat um, if you are interested in either of these programs. Uh, for both of these programs, please make sure you apply by February 14th uh, to se secure your early bird pricing discount. And uh, the last two things on our list, um, please reach out to me. I'll again, post my email in the chat so you can reach out to me um, if you'd like to become an MIT Bootcamps ambassador. This means that you have uh, first access to all of our webinars that come out as well as um, any new programs that, that come up. Um, we often reach out to these folks in order to get those first stages of feedback from us. And lastly, um, if you're interested, please feel free to check out the MIT Bootcamps graduate directory. Again, I'll list those in the chat. So thank you again. Um, and for now, I will be passing it off to Anna. Hello, everyone. So happy to be here with you all today. And this is actually a really special uh, day for us uh, and for me personally. It's an honor to introduce Professor Ramesh Rastar. And for me, it, it really touches me personally because I was an MIT Media Lab graduate student when Ramesh joined the lab as a professor. And he was a member of my thesis committee. So it's a, it's like going home. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, it's a long time, by the way. So I had the pleasure to witness the start of his really impressive trajectory at MIT as an academic, an innovator and an entrepreneur himself, an investor, an advisor. And he is the associate professor at MIT Media Lab, and he directs the Camera Culture Research Group with a focus on machine learning and imaging for health and sustainability. He's an inventor himself. His research has led into multiple innovations from physical devices like sensors, and digital devices and like automated and 
physically privacy aware machine learning global uh, solutions uh, in geo maps and mobility domains and he co-founded invested on a series of companies and even a nonprofit that he started during the in the early days of the pandemic I particularly closely followed one of his startups, iNetra, uh, he, that he launched with a colleague from Brazil. And I can tell you, like a lot of these companies are already making a big impact into the world. Uh, this person, Vitor Pompona, uh, co-founded with Ramesh, a company, for instance, to give you some clarity of practical uh, products he got out, spent off from MIT, they started using a simple smartphone to perform eyesight tests. Uh, it started in low-income countries, but it has evolved and made great, great impact. And this device helps you make an, uh, run an eye exam to measure a person's eye prescription for eyeglasses. And this has been worldwide. This is just one example. This is one of the companies launched. And I'm sure you have a lot to learn from Ramesh. Take this opportunity here today to ask questions. And his time is very precious. And we're so happy to have you here, Ramesh. Welcome. Welcome to MIT Blue Tents. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Anna. Indeed, it's such a pleasure to see you, Anna, uh, back here uh, at the MIT Media Lab. I feel like I'm sitting across, this, uh, across the table from you. Um, so hello everyone, uh, I'm Ramesh Raskar, professor at uh, MIT. Uh, I'm going to show you a few slides to just get started, uh, but we can keep it very interactive. Um, and talk of, talk, of, uh, talk a bit about, you know, what are some opportunities in, uh, in AI uh, that are, you know, very exciting. Uh, at the same time, talk about entrepreneurship in general, okay? So can you see my slides? Yes, we Excellent. can. They're not on like a presentation mode, but we can see it. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna keep it this way so that um, I can, uh, all right. That's so right. so I'm gonna talk about uh, decentralized AI and um, the the opportunities in that. And you know, I'll start with a, a kind of a, you know, a possibility where imagine, you know, I have a cousin, Tara, and she lives in rural Texas. And, uh, you know, she has some chest pain. Um, her family has history of lung cancer. She recently had COVID uh, and she's just concerned and she's not getting very good guidance uh, from her doctors in rural Texas. You know, um, here's her chest x ray, here's her background, what treatment options should she have and so on. And imagine I could just say, you know what, I'm going to spend a $1,000 uh, for Tara and I as Ramesh can just bid on the internet saying, hey, I I'm willing to give $1,000. Who can pro suggest the best treatment plan for my cousin Tara, right? How would we do this? Now, the way it works in today's world is if there's some unique health condition, you know, researchers will ask for research funding. They'll lot aggregate a lot of data. You know, they'll do some research, they'll find some patterns, they'll publish that research. You know, at some point, FDA will pick that up. It might become a new protocol. And then eventually, some years down the line, doctors will start using that as a, as a guidance, right? This is an extremely slow process. You know, it could take 10 years from science to service. But imagine if you had a God's eye view and I can uh, put together in a kind of millions of petabytes of data of everybody's health condition in the world, mm -hmm. Anybody who has, you know, uh, chest pain, anybody who had COVID and so on, that's the first thing. Look at all the health data. Then I can train the best machine learning model from this millions of petabyte of data. And then take my thousand dollars and give it to people from whom uh, I did, uh, for whom I did use the data, uh, but not give it money to people whose data eventually was not used. Uh, and eventually, you know, start suggesting treatments like you would see on Expedia or Orbitz or your favorite airline search engine. You know, here, here's a more aggressive treatment. Here's a treatment you can have in rural Texas. Here's a treatment for which you may have to go to a big city and so on, right? Uh, so from a, from a technology point of view, the solution already exists, right? Uh, the question is, how do you make it happen, right? Now, of course, the reality 
um, is that we don't really have a God's eye view. The first in first is we have to look at all the health data in the world. So we have data silos and privacy and regulation and so on. Um, so we can't aggregate the data. Second is what does it mean to train the best AI model? Because you know that could cost you know millions and millions of dollars to train a big machine learning model and all this data. Uh, how can you do it remotely? The third is thousand dollars is not a much amount of money. So I'm going to reward all the people who might be willing to contribute the data because you know it's not just me who's spending thousand dollars. There are many other people willing to spend hundred dollars, five hundred dollars, thousand dollars to get solutions for them as, themselves. So it's kind of a multi-sided problem where some people want answers and some people have the answers and you want to create a marketplace between them. And then finally, how do you create highly interpretable treatments like you would see on an airline search engine uh, for treatment plans, right? So that's the challenge we run into uh, with this concept I call decentralized AI, where AI is not centralized like you would see on ChatGPT, uh, but AI is completely decentralized. So the, the interesting part here is that if you're familiar with kind of Web 1, Web 2, Web 3, uh, and Web 3 you might know more as Bitcoin or some other scammy things, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's the, the power of Web3, despite the, the negative connotation, is that it's peer-to-peer, -peer, it's highly decentralized. Uh, but now we can do is we can add AI component to it and make it decentralized, right? And move along the intelligence axis, not only along the connection axis. So that's what it boils down to, to build decentralized AI. Right now, if you're familiar with Bitcoin, then it has pseudo-identity, kind of um, pseudo-anonymity because you have a persistent identifier. And uh, based on that, you know, you can trade Bitcoins and so on, and we have to upgrade that to full-fledged privacy technology, not just anonymity or confidentiality, but full-fledged privacy. That means no information can be leaked. Mm -hmm. Second is that uh, we want ability to create some kind of a ledger technology, uh, you know, in blockchain that already exists for Bitcoin is great, but now we need, we are not, we, we, it goes beyond that. It's not just verifying transactions, but it's about verifying AI. Do you use the right data? Do you use the right model? And so on. The third is right now in the Bitcoin world, you know, you're only using some kind of a gas money or speculation as a reward. Uh, but what we need for health data and other data for AI is create data markets. And finally, instead of exchanges like FTX and Binance that are in big trouble, uh, we need new types of exchanges uh, for this kind of a decentralized AI. Where because you know, individuals are not going to store their keys and run data uh, on their own computers, you know, it will be some large cloud providers, um, you know, that are going to provide these exchanges. So a lot of these things have to happen uh, for the vision of decentralized AI to come true. Uh, but which also means, you know, over the next ten years, this is a massive opportunity for entrepreneurs uh, to create all kinds of different ventures. Right? Just if you have, if you're ten years ago and you heard that, hey, the trend in AI is coming, you know, you would have prepared for it. Uh, and I think the next 10 years are going to be about decentralized AI uh, and many ventures are going to come uh, into this space. And again, what I described is not just about, about health, but it can be any other sectors that require social orchestration. It could be supply chain, it could be traffic, it could be energy, it could be sustainability, it could be you know human resources. All these issues that are societal coordination is going to be deployed with decentralized AI. So it's just an exciting time to think about AI uh, going forward. So at the same time, what are some things in AI that, that really makes sense? This is a slide I took from Andrew Ng. And um, you know, he talks about you know, these four major areas that we all know, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning, and generative AI. And I know everybody's very you know, highly influenced by generative AI right now, but it's a very tiny fraction of the AI world. Uh, the world of supervised training, supervised learning, uh, is actually you know very big already, and it's going to get even bigger. Um, generative AI, which started very small and is getting bigger, uh, you know, is still not going to be as big as as supervised learning. Uh, and then, according to Andrew, at least, he thinks the other two fields, uh, you know, reinforcement learning and so on, are not going to make that big a dent. I mean, some people agree, some people don't agree, but it's good to realize that the relative opportunities for building AI ventures are roughly distributed uh, in this particular way. And there are, this is the you know a billion dollar secret I'm giving away to you. Uh, if you're going to start an AI venture, there's one main formula you have to use. 
which is every AI venture has three parts. How do you capture the data? How do you analyze it? And how do you make it interactive, right? And how do you do all of this with continuous learning? So any AI project has these three components. And most people think that the best way to start AI companies is to do actually the, you know, to do the analysis, which is machine learning, privacy, security, and so on. Uh, but in reality, uh, the most value for a startup is actually uh, available in the capture phase or the interactive phase. You know, how do you capture the data in a very unique way, whether it's a knowledge graph or, you know, industry standards or, you know, um, or real time data coming from your microphones or text and so on. Uh, that's the biggest value. Uh, and then interact. Like, how do you create a user interface that allows an individual to interact with AI? And how do you allow multiple people to interact with the same AI and collaborate at the same time? So anyway, I just gave away a few billion dollar secrets on uh, what are the key components you need uh, to start an AI venture. Let me stop there and we can have some conversation about, um, uh, about, about AI, AI ventures and how to start companies and so on. So uh, Ramesh, thank you so much. We'll be capturing questions here from the chat. And actually, I'd like to start uh, with the question for you. Uh, this is the AI landscape. So has been quite dominated by big tech companies and organizations like OpenAI. I mean, in some, <laughs> most recently, I would say. And what do you recommend like for early stage AI entrepreneurs uh, in this landscape? Very good question. So let me um, go to this slide. But I'll make all the slides available to you, so uh, you can take a look at that. Um, so the, the question really is, how do we create strong moat companies? Companies that are, you know, will not be disrupted uh, just because Google released a new feature or OpenAI released a new feature. So if you look at kind of bottom left, uh, so first of all, the access, right? Like what is the effort required? Low effort versus high effort. And moat is, you know, how much of a barrier to entry others have or how easily will your company will be disrupted. Um, so weak moat versus strong moat, right? Uh, if you look at screen AI, that's where a lot of companies start. You know, these are chatbots, office aids, content creation, and so on. The problem is that um, this, these ventures are easy to build but are easily appended, right? So I don't recommend, you know, starting companies on the bottom left, right? Uh, then there's some other companies which are I would call sprinkled AI or thin AI, uh, which is, you know, it's a band-aid for big data in sectors. So, you know, a health company might come and say, hey, you know, we want to sprinkle some AI in our project. So maybe we'll build some chatbots, you know, we will put that in some customer service, we'll add some summarization, and you know, maybe we'll kind of ride this AI wave by just sprinkling a few things. They'll hire some consultants, they'll you know, hire uh, uh, some small startups and do that. Uh, but this doesn't really work because you have to really do an AI first approach. Uh, you know, like Airbnb is beating Marriott and not because Airbnb is a better Marriott or a better Hyatt or pick your favorite hotel, but they were internet first. They thought about internet first um, as, their, as their module as opposed to Marriott, which said, oh, we are a hotel, so we're gonna start an online service uh, for, for Marriott. Um, so similarly, AI first companies are gonna be very different than companies that are using Sprinkled AI. And then finally, uh, there's dimensional AI, uh, which is this notion that, you know, you would, you would um, uh, you know, create companies that are the intersection of AI and certain sectors, you know, mobility, smart cities, productivity, health, and so on. And this unfortunately requires, you know, multidimensional execution and multidimensional effort, but, you know, can capture entering value, right? And so dimensional AI is basically this new philosophy where you have, you know, multidimensional teams, multidimensional physical world, and multidimensional execution. And when you do that, you're going to be, you know, much more safe. Uh, and this way you can be away from the risk that you have where, Amazon or Google or OpenAI might spend, you know, stay focused on their foundation models and just add a feature and that just disrupts everybody. So if you have used like Jasper AI or if you use Prisma, all these products, 
you know, they look great for six months and then OpenAI releases one feature and then just for AI and all these things becomes completely meaningless, right? Uh, so that's the challenge you run into. Um, and the way to think about that is you think about the AI totem. You know, what are all the things that happen in, in uh, you know, in an AI world? So you have, if you start at the bottom, then you have kind of computer hardware and chips. Then you have cloud platforms like AWS and Google Cloud and so on. Then you have the foundation models, which is where open AI sits. Uh, but I would call all this in blue is kind of an AI core, right? And it's very difficult to start companies in this space. But if you go in the dimensional AI world, which is you know tailored ML, which is how do you take the foundation models and you tailor them? How do you modify them uh, to work for a given application? How do you use some soft, horizontal software platforms like privacy technology, identity technology, data APIs, and so on? And then finally, applications, which are very sectoral, right? Kind of AI for X. Uh, and then you combine that with emerging technologies like 5G, 6G, VR, AR, Web3, geospatial, and so on. If you're in the top half of this, it's much easier to start a venture. If you're in the bottom half, it's actually very risky uh, to start a venture. So that's one way to think about, uh, you know, how you can uh, start thinking about new types of uh, AI ventures. By the way, this data comes from uh, a McKinsey report, and they show that the, do you know, the dollar opportunity over the next five years is roughly you know, much higher in this top areas than the bottom areas. Although most of the things you see in the newspaper uh, is about the bottom part, but that's because you know, bigger companies in this space haven't emerged yet. That, that's fascinating, thank you. And actually we have a question on a, an application uh, with patient's data. Ashutosh, would you like to open your microphone and ask the question yourself? Let me see if you can hear us. If not, I'll pass it on. So Ashutosh is asking, uh, can you can you, can you me, say Anna? it? Yes, please. Oh, please great. Take Thank it you. on. Hi, Professor uh, Rathkar. Thank you for sharing this uh, great uh, presentation. Um, I come from a background uh, with Intel, worked with uh, like a team in federal machine learning um, uh, program. And my question is the challenge that we always face was, as people always said, it's very possible to reverse engineering patient data in case of uh, like a privacy preserved machine learning approaches. And uh, work we always did with GE, Health, Siemens, Healthy Linear, uh, Alkins, they always had this concern. And there's always like active research showing that, hey, you can always use weights and biases to, to really like get back to what the patient data is. So ultimately beats the uh, whole uh, premise behind uh, decentralized AI. Uh, how easy it is, I want to understand uh, from your experience and uh, expertise. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question, Ashutosh, and I'm glad you're asking this important question because in decentralized AI, one of the promises that you can train AI without centralizing the data. The assumption, of course, is that the data stays with patients or it stays with hospitals and you can still uh, train your model. Like you said, kind of big hospitals might be concerned that, hey, your claiming is decentralized, but our data is getting leaked uh, from this model. So those of you who don't know, federated learning is an approach that allows you to train uh, machine learning models without centralizing data. And then uh, at MIT, we have our own approach called split learning, you know, like splitting uh, mm -hmm. the models. And the split learning is, a, in our opinion, is a better approach than federated learning. But nevertheless, both of these have this risk that uh, somebody could reverse engineer uh, these models and figure out what data was used uh, to train them. Uh, and that's a very valid concern. Uh, there's a lot of research and a lot of products actually in that space of how would you do that uh, without by making sure you know, data is not leaked. And some of them use kind of differential privacy for you know adding noise to federal learning models. Yeah. Uh, in our case at MIT for split learning, we have something called Disco, which is, you know, we have a way to uh, kind of add white noise to uh, certain areas uh, of the model. So it's a very rich area, uh, the whole field of privacy, preserving machine learning, PPML. Uh, you should just look it up. I think it's a fantastic area to not only to create new ventures, but once you understand PPML, uh, you realize that you can build AI companies in a completely new way. Uh, yeah, so yeah. I think... Those of you who are very excited about generative AI, please keep track of uh, PPML because that's kind of the, the upcoming wave. 
Well, thank you, Professor uh, Rasker. One uh, thing I would say is that, uh, uh, I, I, is it okay if, uh, if I connect you later? Uh, in yeah, just be willing to, yes. Because uh, I'm starting a venture uh, using that experience of my own at Intel and using federated machine learning on my platform as well in one of the applications to, uh, in healthcare specifically. Uh, for uh, like a uh, low and middle income countries, uh, so uh, it will we be need, great. We too. need more of your shitosh to solve these problems in, uh, you know, new areas. So health, thank you, and serving the underserved is our great areas. Okay, I'll I'll connect with you later. Thank you so much. So Ramesh, uh, it's really interesting that we delve into more of the health and the patient, like, I mean, health uh, possibilities, opportunities into health tech. Um, we have actually uh, other folks here who are not so technical as Ashutosh and don't have experience and are starting their companies and are really intrigued about how to navigate this world of AI. And one of them, uh, I think we have some questions here that are like from Sidalia. Sidalia, would you like to open your microphone? To share your question, I can brief Ramesh about the question. Uh, sorry, what's the question? So she says, I'm actually planning the first stages of my startup. How can I get further details and frameworks that help me build on the formula that you have just shared for Fantastic. the AI project? Fantastic. So if you're if you're you know if you're thinking about entrepreneurship in general, uh, then you know I would encourage you to look at uh, you know, whole whole framework we have in our online course. Uh, I'm just trying to find the slides. I can give you a flavor uh, of how this works. Um, Sounds great. And and is that uh, is that uh, easy for me to understand with very basic data science background? Because my background is nursing. Is yeah, not yeah, necessarily. Yeah. yeah. No, I think I think you have a strength because you have a you know a sectoral knowledge. Yes. And, exactly. And, and, and because you have sector knowledge, you know, you can beat other people, um, you know, because you need some kind of unfair knowledge. So if you want to yeah. start kind of AI and nursing. Yeah, that's no, it. Nobody can be better than you. So, uh, you know, so I'll just, I, I won't go into detail, but I'll just share with you the slides. Um, and um, if I can bring this. So, so basically the way to think about this, sorry, I'm, I'm just going to, Compress a little bit slow because I'm slight going through a lot of slides here. Yeah. So um, the way to think about this is, uh, you know, when you're starting a company, it you know it feels very very daunting. Like where do you even start, right? Uh, given that nine out of ten startups fail, and you know, um, you know. It seems like only good things only happen in Silicon Valley and nowhere else, and this is all BS, right? Um, actually, can do anywhere in the world, um, and you should go through this four-stage process. We call it spot, probe, grow, and launch. Identify and validate opportunities, validate the solution, you know, build fully functional products and devices, and then successfully deploy. Uh, and there's a whole formula. I'll post the link uh, uh, in the chat about how you do this in a very systematic manner, and anybody can do it, right? Um, so, you know, how do you figure out what the strategy is? How do you figure out what the domains are uh, and so on? Uh, and, the, and the one that I'll kind of focus on for the next few minutes is uh, how do you pick the grand opportunity and how do you explore the grand opportunity, right? Um, and so, you know, straightforward stuff uh, here. The first thing you need to do is like write a very clean question. Right, like how can I use AI and imaging to improve the safety and cost of autonomous vehicles? Right. So you might say something like, "How can you use AI uh, to improve, you know, the outcome for patients uh, using nurses as emp by empowering nurses?" Right, or something along those lines. It has to be a very precise statement, and we have some ideas of how to come up with a precise statement. Once you have do done that, you um, go through this four-stage process called resource map, problem canvas, solution canvas, and uh, find what? Sorry, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted, I, I was more talking about the formula for the AI co-pilot co because what I'm interested is 
uh, once I get the funding, so I apply for funding, if I get the funding, what right. I want to, because, you know, I'm not technical right. uh, and I obviously want to build because the success of the company will be data and right. how I'm going to organize and store data. So then I can use that in my favor to analyze things and trends and, you know, optimize opportunities. Right. Um, and when you showed me like the capture, analyze, interact, I was quite mm -hmm. curious on the way that you actually kind of go deep deep down into that framework in order to actually streamline the more AI process of data collection and uh, organization of data and make it optimize it in a more technical way to do what you want to do, <laughs> but in Absolutely. a more cost effective way. And that's the that's the area that I've been trying to figure out how to do well or who, who can I partner with that I will make it as more sustainable as possible as a minimal viable product without spending too much money, for example, either structuring data SQL or no, in non-relational databases. Mm -hmm. So those kind of things that is the area that I'm trying now to understand how it works and how can I optimize it well so I can long-term have these possibilities that you're talking about that you can use it in a very, in ways that you probably possibly can't imagine today. Yeah, yeah. Um, so absolutely, that's what I was covering a little bit. So, you know, it's, as I said, it's very difficult to, like, I can't answer your question directly, of course, if I knew that, you know, then we would just be co-founders um, and to, to do this. Uh, but you have to go through this f phase of like, where are the resources that you need? Like, what's the problem you should solve uh, and so on. And you need to take these information um, on, on, you know, to, to, um, uh, to uh, see, you know, where the data would come from, for example. So in terms of resource map, what you do is you, you make a list of everything that's out there, all the peoples and organizations, all the users and beneficiaries, all the breakthroughs and risks in this space, right? Uh, and then you end up creating something, a, a resource map that looks something like this. This one is for self-driving cars and AI and imaging, uh, but, you know, ecosystem for self-driving cars, not just self-driving cars. Uh, so like parking, insurance, traffic, safety, all those things. Uh, and then you take all these players, you know, that you may not realize. So if you're thinking about nurses, you might think, hey, I'm just here to help nurses, but maybe the insurance company plays a role. Maybe the CEO of the hospital plays a role. Maybe the patients play a role. Maybe the, the association of nurse, you know, association of nurses plays a role or nursing school plays a role uh, and so on, right? So there are lots of stakeholders in what you're trying to do. So you need to do that. Uh, and then you have to kind of do this problem canvas. You have to like write down, all the sub problems you would like to solve. In this case, it's about, again, self-driving car ecosystems. It's like parking, insurance, and so on. Uh, but in case of nurses, it might be, you know, uh, patient outcomes, you know, uh, nurse fatigue, you know, and things like that. Uh, and then on the other axis, you would write all the technologies you might use. Uh, then you would kind of rank them, and it will give you the formula. And eventually you come up with something that, a plot that looks like this. How much, how much will it cost to solve this problem? How much time will it take to solve this problem? And you write down all those opportunities. Like, you know, maybe it's about, you know, nurses fatigue. Maybe it's about nurses, you know, uh, error rates. Maybe it's about improving efficiency. Maybe it's about, you know, improving, you know, uh, nurse education, right? Um, and then you would plot that thing and see like, where can you have the biggest impact in limited amount of time and cost? And once you have this, then you can go to your partners and say, hey, I would like to get a lot of data from you or, hey, you're an investor, I want to talk to you because you know I did all this analysis and I really want to pick something like a yellow circle here because I think it has a large impact, but it's not going to cost that much time and money uh, for me, right? Um, so, so that's how you're going to get started. And then when it comes to the AI Copilot, uh, as I said earlier, let me just find that slide one more time. Uh, when it comes to AI Copilot, you basically need uh, nine components to build an AI Copilot, okay? And they're listed here. Um, and if you can um, take these seven that are on the outer circle, which is different ways to capture your data, which I talked about earlier, different ways to analyze and different ways to interact, those are the seven things. Plus you need two things, you need a continuous learning and scalability. Now, most of these modules are actually available from cloud providers and other API providers, right? So if you're doing it for nursing, you know, to figure out where does all this data come from? Because you might be interested in only 
data coming from hospitals, uh, but actually there's a lot of other data, knowledge graph, all the instruction manuals of nurses, all the industry data, uh, you know, latest best practices and so on, uh, all the data that's stored in the hospital that could all come through. So once you take these two pieces together, kind of the resource map and findings plot, as well as this formula for AI Copilot, you know, you'll be able to come up with a pitch to whoever you want to talk to saying, hey, this is the reason I want your data, or even when you're trying to recruit your technology, uh, you know, savvy co-founder or a team, you'll have a whole formula ready for you. So they don't think that, hey, just because, you know, you don't know technology, you're not going to be a good CEO, good co-founder. If you've done all this background work, you'll be ready to make a pitch. Hope that helps. No, that's great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ramesh. And I actually have another question here that uh, seems to be like you know, someone um, without a, a lot of background in AI. So it's Juan Luis. Um, he asks about how do you define the AI, requir the AI requirements and how do you evaluate the results? It seems it's a very open and broad question. Uh, Juan, would you like to uh, add any color to this question? You can you open up your microphone, please. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, Professor Rasper, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. My question is actually in this uh, view graph because you have captured, analyzed, and interact. So to me, it's somehow similar to over um, special intelligence cycle. Mm -hmm. But what I miss there is the requirement. So what is the problem that you try to solve? Uh, how do you evaluate if the problem has been solved or not? You can elaborate, please. Thank you. So I could not hear the last part. So my main question is, how do you determine the requirements of what the project has to do? And the second part is, how do you evaluate the results? OK. I, I think I understood that you want to kind of come up with a way to create and evaluate uh, these, these mechanisms. And um, I mean, that's a pretty broad question, but um, I mean, no, it's continuous learning is very critical uh, in, in, in every scenario. And so there are kind of some standard methods on, you know, how you would kind of improve this flywheel because it's not just about capture, analyze, interact, but, you know, if you think about, you know, any large tech company, uh, this is their open secret. Right. So the reason why Uber, you know, is better than a taxi company is one reason and one reason only, which is it's continuous learning. Right. So when you, you know, in a taxi cab, you get the taxi cab, you ride the taxi cab and you get down. Uh, but the taxi company has no information. Uh, they don't have any telemetry. There's no feedback on how the driver is doing, how the passenger is doing. Did they like the experience? Did they save time by taking the right route? You know how much was the time spent in waiting for the cab? How much time was spent in driving? You know, in the in the in the cab and so on. So all the information is completely lost. Um, and then Uber is able to actually do that. They're able to capture that data, analyze that data, and then create an experience, interact. You know, a, you know, a driver and a and a rider, right? And continuously do that loop. And if you go to these companies, there's these huge screens that you will see in these companies that are constantly monitoring every metric that they care about. The, you know, the few metrics I just mentioned. And they plot them every day. And they say, every week, can I improve that metric by 1%? I can improve that by half a percent or 2%. And that's all they do. They hire thousands of PhDs to do that one task. Like, how can you improve the metric by 1% per week, right? Uh, and if you did that, you know, you'll be twice as good by the end of the year, right? Um, so, so I think those are the kind of things that really matter. Uh, when you're building an AI-centric company, as opposed to you know a brick and mortar business like a taxi company. So thank you, Ramesh. Uh, I think we can um, just tag along about like this model that you showed, the moat versus effort mm -hmm. framework. If you could go back to it, um, we have a question from Christian. Christian. Godoy, would you like to open your microphone? Let's see if you can 
So yes, please take it on. Kristen, your, your microphone is open now. Would you like to speak? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Oh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Roscar, for, for your time. Um, so my question is regarding um, the uh, framework that you showed, uh, the moat versus effort uh, diagram. Right. Mm -hmm. So I understand that we're sort of in a in, in a gold rush for for AI development, similar to the to the to the dot com era of the early two thousand. <laughs> and uh, my question is related to the the pick and shovel plays. Right? right? Is there anything else that it's kind of emerging, but it's not being uh, kept uh, um, on on the loop. Um, and uh, you know, I I work for AWS, and and uh, you know, we're deploying a ton of data center um, capacity to accommodate machine learning, and there's a lot of infrastructure being deployed. You got things like Project uh, Kuiper, the satellite constellation. Um, and uh, one third of, of, of humanity doesn't have um, access to, to the internet. So that's a huge amount of data that hasn't been mined, right? So mm -hmm. that's an example of a pick and shovels play that I had in mind, but I don't know if there's anything else that maybe you think the public is not really looking at. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the way to think about this is, um, you know, in a gold rush, you have, um, you know, Instead of gold, you should go after you know the shovels, as you said. Uh, but there's another way to think about this, which is um, in a gold rush. Um, you know, uh, so if you think about this chart again, and if you think about AI as a gold rush, uh, then the AI core is kind of pick, you know building the shovels, saying how do I make you know AI better and faster and cheaper and more efficient and so on. Uh, um, and, but the smart people are not building the shells uh, because that's too late and there's a limited business, uh, but they're trying to build the jewelry, right? They're saying, oh, if the gold comes out, you know, the real value is going to be actually in, you know, adding more value to gold, which is by creating jewelry and selling jewelry, right? Uh, so the smarter people are not focusing on the shells, they're focusing on the jewelry because you, you know that it's going to take you one, two, three years to actually get the venture going. And so you want to go where the puck is going as opposed to where the puck is. And so the top part here, which is the dimensional AI, is actually the jewelry. And the bottom part here is kind of the shells, right? Um, and so, um, uh, you know, you're at AWS, so you're you know very close to what Amazon is doing uh, in this space and all the power to Amazon and big players because those cloud players will be building the right kind of shells. Uh, but we as entrepreneurs can focus on the jewelry. Understood. Thank you. So thank you so much. This is a very insightful discussion. And please, uh, everyone uh, attending the session, keep your questions coming. And now transitioning a bit to some questions about themes that are have been discussed lately about ethics, bias, data privacy, regulation, and many concerns, even like researchers um, asking for a halt in some AI uh, developments uh, recently. So yeah. it's a very heated debate. <laughs> so we have a question from Harry Wong. It's about, he says, data is very important, is a very important resource for AI. Mm -hmm. But there are rising concerns on privacy and information security. How to get edge now to get this data? I'm sorry if I didn't fully convey it. Uh, Henry, would you like to add more color to your question? Uh, hello? Yes, go ahead. Yes. Hi. Uh, thank you, Professor. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a student in computer science right now. Um, so I, when I try to like apply this model, like when I try to um, like, for example, I check GBT and all this kind of thing, like I always like wonder like, if I put some of my personal information into this public domain, like how likely my information will be shared. And I think uh, more and more, like, this kind of concern is in the, uh, the one platform you mentioned about the PPML. Mm -hmm. um, my, my question is, um, would that be in the direction like instead of 
now it's basically a centralized uh, server to hold all the information. Would would that be become more and more uh like more like a self host or like a a single computer run AI something like that in the future, which all the information like my private information will be kept in a in a in a single secure place or something like that. Or yeah. Like how how that being treated <laughs> like in the future? Yeah. No, absolutely. I just put up a slide here because a lot of people ask questions about you know, the major risks with AI is kind of job disruption, you know, um, uh, you know, information being mostly on the screen, we're living mostly digital lives, or like you said, the six months pause that Anna was talking about. Um, and, and I think these are all very important questions because, you know, I mean, right now in life, if you, whatever you're doing in your life, I think it's time to stop working on it and you should work only on AI. For, because for the next five years, there's nothing else left to do than AI. Every sector we know, uh, is going to be disrupted uh, by AI. So stop doing whatever you're doing and focus your life. Like take courses, you know, uh, watch YouTube videos, you know, uh, uh, do some no code app development, you know, uh, learn about everything, everything you can hear about AI. And, you know, you can, if you skip watching the Barbie movie or, you know, if you don't know the latest, you know, uh, pop culture, it's perfectly fine for the next five years because the only thing that matters is, is AI. Um, at the same time, as I said, it also brings, you know, a, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of challenges. Uh, so things like personal data and, and so on are critical. Uh, but like Ashutosh was saying earlier, uh, techniques like privacy preserving machine learning are extremely powerful. Uh, the research is already pretty mature. So my group here at MIT is one of the leaders in privacy preserving machine learning. Um, and that's our research area because of our decentralized AI work. So, so that's you know, so so that's coming. But you know, the awareness is very critical, and startups should be using uh, PPML as opposed to using centralization approaches uh, and so on. Uh, and I think you know, I'm I'm pretty sure over the next couple of years this will become the norm. Um, and as I said earlier, uh, if you're building a startup, you know, be very very familiar with PPML. Although today, generative AI seems like the most exciting area. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we have, this is fascinating, a lot of heated debates and some folks, uh, we, there are some MIT professors very involved in this uh, discussion on the ethics, right? Um, some of the media lab, I mean, there's some media lab graduates and also like, I remember Max Tegmark yeah. from, uh, yeah, a physics professor, right? He's very involved right. in this theme. So it's very interesting and intriguing and yeah. so many others. So we really should watch out. And I think we have another question here that could be a uh, tag along this one. Um, so what about the biases and ethical considerations? So how do you recommend the entrepreneurs to um, address these issues when, if they are really early stage? They're still yeah. scratching the surface of what they're doing. What kind of advice would you give to them? Yeah, I think it's a very good question as well about uh, bias, ethics, accessibility, uh, kind of heterogeneous data sets. Um, you know, lopsided data sets. Um, do you have enough representation uh, in a given data set, uh, and and things like that? So they're all very valid questions. Um, the the um, and it's, you know a lot of people are working on it. We should not dismiss them. The one thing I would say broadly is that uh, don't get too uh, dejected or too focused on those problems. Uh, because these are the problems just like spam. Spam was a big issue like 10, 15 years ago, uh, and we know now how to how to deal with it, right? Uh, misinformation was a big issue, which is still a big issue, but there are solutions for it. So broadly, what I would say is that if there's a problem with technology, and if people enough people understand it's a problem should be solved, it will get solved, okay? As opposed to something that's about policy or society or you know, culture, where if there's an issue, it remains an issue for generations. Uh, that doesn't, that's not the case with technology and, and software. So my general advice would be not to get too fixated on these problems. Just assume that you or somebody else is going to solve them. And over the next, you know, two to three years, they will be solved. 
and then just start focusing on things that really matter to you as opposed to getting getting uh, either either disappointed or or overly obsessed uh, about these issues so and this is true not just about the issues I talked about but almost anything if there's a problem with technology and 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 software it'll get solved so don't get too fixated around that Thank you very much. And actually, we, we come from the technology side, but we do like it. And MIT has strong, in addition to all this, uh, our passion for technology, we do have this um, uh, like responsibility and we watch out for this ethics. Uh, yeah, so it's, uh, I just remember just to mention like with this um, graduate from the Media Lab, Joy Buolonini, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, she's a computer scientist. She founded Algorithmic Justice League. Yeah. So she works on challenge, like on biases, especially with uh, uh, racial biases in, in AI algorithms and all like and other biases as well. So there are folks working on these um, themes and watch out for them. But I and I understand Ramesh's point, and I think I, I second you, Ramesh, when you say that let's not make let them stop us. Let's keep going, but be mindful of them and try Absolutely. and pass, right? And 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 people people like Joy and Max Tegmark, you know, are the kind of leaders we need who understand technology and are talking from experience of, you know, the what what is responsible behavior here. So definitely follow both of them. Uh, you know, Max Tegmark just did a very nice. Uh, podcast on uh, with Lex Friedman, and it's a, it's a it's a three hour podcast. I recommend you to do listen to it twice, three times because Max has some really amazing insights on how responsible AI is going to evolve. Uh, and and Joy, uh, you know, who was a grad student here, were doing some amazing work um, uh, with technology, not just policy, um, is is also fantastic. So um, again. You can you can treat them as you know great leaders for reminding how to how to address it, but they're not just talking about the problems; they're talking about the solutions. That's what makes them great. And I think all of us as entrepreneurs also have to have a very solutions driven mindset, as opposed to let's discuss, debate, and continue to debate mindset. Wonderful. I did watch this uh, episode. Uh, <laughs> Mariah is posting it uh, on the chat. Check it out. Max Tegmar, really amazing. Um, so uh, another question, like tagging along the theme, now more about regulation, and because uh, there are some movements about uh, in this realm of, okay, let's discuss ethics, biases, et cetera, how and what kind of regulations should be setting place uh, either either industry regulations like a governmental and we have a question from Jason Yang about this um, so Jason would you like to open your microphone uh, yeah uh, thank you and uh, I, I uh, thank you professor I work for um, financial institution broker dealer and we are discussing about uh, implement the uh, the AI. Uh, however, currently the the financial regulator are very um, very concerned about some technology in this area uh, because the AI is not uh, sub, maybe not meet the the requirement of accuracy and also could be some misleading um, even for the chatbot or even for some uh, decision making or some something. So, well, what is your source or attitudes uh, like uh, implement the AI technology in the financial industry or in some <laughs> other industry which require um, some accuracy data uh, and uh, service? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, fintech is you know a very exciting area overall, and uh, we'll probably see the the deployment of AI you know in its earliest form. Um, but the one common trick I would suggest anybody to, um, you know, deal with this like AI plus X scenario, like, oh, how would AI make a difference in FinTech is to simply use chat GPT because that answer is going to be so much better than my answer. Um, because if you just, if you just type something like, how can I harness AI uh, for a FinTech startup? Or how do you think AI is going to change 
the fintech world? I think I'll get a really good response um, because it's, I call this kind of a known unknown as opposed to an unknown unknown, right? So all the way from regulation to user experience to advisory services to prediction markets, you know, all those areas uh, are going to be deeply impacted. The As an entrepreneur or as a sector, the risk for fintech is that it's one of the most digitized sector of our economy. Uh, everybody looks in awe uh, with with financial uh, sector because it's very data driven. You know there are great interfaces. You know there are good uh, prediction models and so on. Imagine if you had the same level of experience in other sectors like health or education. Like there's nothing equivalent. You know like 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 fintech. You know I cannot go online and compare like ten different insurance plans or you know or I cannot you know, bid on particular insurance plan to see what they were to give me back. Like there's none of that. So, you know, compared to other sectors, FinTech is highly digital and highly, uh, um, you know, advanced uh, uh, rate to absorb AI, which is also a risk because uh, if it's so digital and the pipes are so well built of interoperability, uh, AI can come in at an extremely fast pace and disrupt most of that market. Um, so this is going to be, uh, you know, a very interesting play. So if you are, you know, a fintech entrepreneur, uh, it's a good news that there's less friction because already digital, already, uh, you know, uh, interoperable, um, so you can get in easily. But the challenge is that um, somebody else can also move in sufficiently fast uh, because the barrier to entry is so low. As opposed to, let's say, you're trying to do, I don't know, AI for mining or AI for nursing. Um, you know, it's going to be difficult for, you know, a large company like even Amazon or Google or pick your favorite company, JP Morgan. It'll take them forever to figure out, you know, how to do AI for nursing, right? Uh, and then you have a you have time to, uh, you know, kind of develop that. Uh, so that's the one risk and, and challenge uh, we have uh, in the fintech world as an entrepreneur. Yes, thank you, uh, uh, Professor. Are there any resources or programs that can help help us to further learning on the AI in the fintech or in the financial entrepreneurs? You yeah, I mean, if you look at, if you just sign up to pitch book, we see, uh, and all the MIT students have access to it. Many universities have access to it. Uh, it's, otherwise it's like $10,000 a year. It's very expensive. Uh, but if you just sign up to their mailing list, pitch book, we see, uh, then they will send you regular documents on trends and, deals and all those things happening in every sector. Um, all the way from education to FinTech to space industry, whatever, right? They'll, you can you can stay on top of that. So I highly recommend signing up for Pitch Book VC. Thank you. Thank you. And switching gears um, to another very interesting theme about the data, uh, like, the data sets that we could use uh, and the computer power, computational power that we might have access to or not uh, to work on our startups. So, so I wonder like if we could open up for Abu, Bak Abu Bakar Bena. So his question is how do we get data for AI startups where the data is not readily available? such as in emerging markets where data may be paper-based or not available publicly. I mean, it's, it tags along the previous question with uh, financial institutions sometimes not being so digitized in some uh, places. So any general advice on this? Uh, and Abu Bakar, would you like to add more color to your question? Yeah, Michael? for sure. Yes, please do. Um, I, I guess the question stems from seeing opportunities in, in markets where you know, the data is not democratized. Um, how do we, as an, an AI startups, um, attempt to gather that data for, for, you know, for our disruptions, the disruptive solutions, uh, when it's usually offline? Have you seen examples of that, or what advice could you give us um, to to work towards that? Um. I mean, yeah, I mean, you're asking about, you know, capture, analyze, act. And unless you have a very clever way to capture the data uh, or, you know, interesting way to engage with end users, you don't have a moat, right? Um, and so you have to figure out what that is. Fortunately, a lot of the data that 
an AI company might use, like nurses using AI as a nursing. Like it's unlikely that a big player understands how to do it. Uh, but if you have a relationship with a local hospital, or if you're, you know, you're part of a nursing association and you have done this exercise that I explained, the spot probe exercise. Uh, if you have done that, then you know you can just have your documentation and kind of you know start building that partnership, uh, and that's where the data is going to come from. Um, and I should also clarify that in many areas, it's not about the data, uh, but it's about ability to simulate something with it. Um, so self-driving car is a you know is a, an example where people thought the only way to train self-driving cars is to drive around millions of miles and capture videos and and lidar and so on. And the real is actually you can put a car in a video game uh, and just render as if the car is, you know, in a, in a simulated video game is driving along the street and then create, you know, all this CGI computer graphics, you know, pedestrians and bicyclists and traffic lights and rain and fog and, and slippery roads and all the stuff. And they can just simulate everything in, you know, a video game and that's enough to generate data of how a self-driving car should behave, right? So in many cases, if you have a good simulator, uh, then you can you know, create data from the simulation as opposed to raw data as well. You still need some real-world data. So in self-driving cars, maybe 95%, 98% of the data is from car games, and maybe 2% of the data is coming from real-world driving. But still, you reduce your you know, data collection by a factor of 50 if it's 98 and 2, right? So, so also think about if there are industries that you're working in uh, where you could do some simulation, the equivalent of a video game uh, for the industry. So, you know, in case of, um, in case of um, you know, kind of patient, doctor, nurse interaction, you know, if there is a video stream, you know, from some hospitals or data stream, you can just take that and simulate a whole bunch of data um, of how this would behave. And from there, you can continue to train. So, so some companies are providing solutions of simulators, um, and some of them have become really big, actually, multi-billion dollars worth. Um, so it's it's an interesting time to think about not just raw data, but also simulation. Thank you. That's fascinating. Wow, we can get a self-driving car. Like when I worked for Udacity.com in Mountain View, uh, we had a self-driving car in the parking lot. It was really hard <laughs> to train the car outside. <laughs> there were lots of constraints, so why not get this uh, simulated like a video game that, that right. has saved us a lot of time. <laughs> so uh, tagging along this uh, same theme on data, uh, processing power. There are a few questions on this theme and I'm sure, I'm not sure like if you like to dive into this because, um, uh, but just if you could give us some color into your perception of how can we make like a question from Tor Tornik is, um, well, AI models can generally take a lot of like, com like bandwidth, computational resources. Um, should we worry, like should we entrepreneurs, as I understand, uh, try to work on making those models like lighter or less uh, intensive from a computing perspective as entrepreneurs, I understand. Yeah, and but you don't want this. Please go ahead. Please go ahead, Ramesh. And maybe yeah. Tony can add more color. Yeah, because, you know, the 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 this goes back to the AI core problem, which is like, should you try to build the shovels to make gold mining easier or should you build the jewelry knowing that you know it's coming out the gold is coming out very soon um so um i think making ai models more efficient uh, and so on i mean i mean there are a lot of companies working in ai core right so i'm not saying you shouldn't do it it's just that it's more difficult to get started in that space unless you already have some some momentum like you know you are an engineer at nvidia and you can your boss is not listening to you, your VP at NVIDIA is not listening to you, you're like, you know what, screw it, I'm just gonna go start my own company. Okay, then you have some leverage. Or, you know, you you know wrote a paper in machine learning and it won the best paper award uh, because you have a way to think about machine learning not as a discrete uh, layers, but some kind of a continuous layer with differential equations. It's like, okay, all right. So, okay, you can, you can you know, come up with a new way to, to do that. So unless you have some uh, very specific uh, you know, uh, entry into that space, 
it's very difficult to work in an AI core area, um, no matter how many good ideas you have. Um, so, so that's the challenge. And so I would, I would, on the jewelry part of the side, on the dimensional AI side, things are slightly easier um, uh, in that sense, because you have the domain expertise uh, of that sector, um, whether it's nursing or FinTech or mining or whatever it is. So that becomes easy. On the other hand, if you have some other knowledge, like, you know, we have people here from AWS and so on, it's like, oh, you know what I really want to work on is privacy, because privacy is not AI, uh, but because of privacy, I can create dimensional AI, right? And so I want to work on privacy versus machine learning. That's a great area as well. So you need to kind of find the right box in that matrix uh, so that you don't, um, you know, slog for the next three years, five years, and the world will go by. Uh, because somebody who was, you know, an engineer at NVIDIA has a much better insight uh, than the insight you have. The, the other trick, by the way, is, you know, entrepreneurship is sometimes you know, hyper-romanticized, but it might be a good idea to just go work in a company for a year or two and, and you know, just do corporate innovation, you know, be part of, you know, you know they call it um, not entrepreneurship, but entrepreneurship, you know, inside the company and say, hey, I just want to work on new projects inside a company can learn a lot and then come out and do it. Then you do your own venture. Thank you very much. Uh, Tarnik, would you like to add any color or was it, um, did we cover it fully? I'm not sure if Tarnik can speak. So I took on my yes, yes. Uh, my, apologies. <laughs> my apologies. Thank you. Thank you so much. I thank you. I heard everything I wanted to hear. The, so, there was one more. There was one more part that uh, Tornik asked, which I didn't answer. Which is, will I think indirectly what he's asking is like, will future models be you know very large models like we see from OpenAI and 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 uh, Google and so on? Uh, and I think the the answer is actually majority of AI you will see in the future will be very tiny models, very small models, you know, well below a gigabyte, maybe even hundred megabytes. Um, as opposed to the ones we have out there, which are 100, mega, 100 gigabytes or bigger, uh, and they'll be extremely so I would say, I would claim that 99% of applications in the future will be actually really small models that will run on your laptop, on your phone, you know, or you know, in a very efficient manner, because they'll be very task specific. They, they don't have to do everything. They just have to solve nursing, they just have to solve fintech, they just have to solve, you know, optimization of energy on your phone or something like that. So they'll be actually very small models. And if you think about even human brain, you know, I mean, uh, and I know this, but Marvin Minsky, who's the kind of one of the godfathers of AI, uh, wrote a book called Society of the Mind. And before that, everybody thought that the best way to build AI is to build this big monolithic, you know, a model. And what what um, Marvin Minsky said is that it's a society of minds, which means there are multiple minds, and there's a society of all these tiny, tiny minds. That's what's going to work. And the human brain works the same way. There's no such thing as one single, you know, intelligence unit. We have many, many small units, one on vision, one on language, one on planning, one on perception, um, uh, one on, on memory and so on. And they all talk to each other through very fast gateways, you know, through very fast interconnects. So even our brain is made up of many, many small models that are talking to each other. Um, of course, there's some benefits to centralizing it, but there are even more benefits to staying you know, um, kind of distributed and decentralized uh, in that sense. So I would, I would, I would say that most of the models going forward will not will be actually not just large models, uh, but small models that are may have been trained from a large model. But you take a piece of it and do either some kind of distillation or some kind of a transfer learning, um, and you distill this one trillion parameter model to you know a one gigabyte model and so on. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ramesh. I'm actually posting the uh, Marvin Minsky Society of Mind book. They can also check the previous book <laughs> that he mentions that uh, he defines the perceptron concept. So yeah. it's uh, many decades ago, <laughs> he had already started thinking about this, a legend who unfortunately passed away, but Ramesh and I were there at the lab when he was still working, amazing. Um, so just, uh, maybe we're getting close to the end. Uh, there's a question from, uh, Ryong Cho about whether, uh, 
still in this computational power realm, uh, since AI uses a lot of computational power and there are great progress in quantum computing, um, do you have any insights on this regard? I know like, maybe I'm not sure how close to your area of expertise or research, uh, are you using quantum computing somehow? But if so, would you like to add something uh, about this? If not, we can pass, can move on. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I can just say very briefly, I mean, quantum computing and a lot of technologies are extremely exciting, uh, but still very, very far away. And, you know, like people who are experts in quantum computing who have their own startups, so they have to be a little bit more optimistic, are telling us that they're at least 10 years away from any meaningful uh, quantum computations because the noise in each of the qubits is so high that, uh, you know, they cannot do any meaningful uh, computation right now. Uh, so yeah, we are several years away. So don't start a company in quantum computing. Not yet. So thank you, Ramesh. And I know we are getting uh, questions from folks who have already asked questions. So uh, we'll try to be, uh, we call it like, and we give like some, have some equity rules. So we give everyone uh, opportunities to ask at least one question. So if time permits, we'll go for our second question for folks who asked us. Um, just want to switch gears a little bit to a theme that's one of the most, <laughs> more, the most frequently asked questions we have in our programs are about funding and investment. So learners often come to our programs with some uh, in their early stage ventures or already have their ventures going and some are even earlier, but they do want to get prepared to fundraise and make this event if need be. So the question is, um, what do you think investors and, and VCs in general like should look, are looking for when evaluating AI ventures from your perspective? And how can entrepreneurs make their ventures more fundable? Yeah, in yeah. this realm of AI. Yeah, I know, I know funding appears to be, um, you know, something that causes a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress uh, among entrepreneurs. Uh, I would say it's exactly the opposite. You should really think about how do you prepare for it, so that when you actually do the fundraising, it's very easy. Um, and um, I think the preparation has to be, I like to call it shock and awe. You have so much material prepared and you have so much, you know, great work already done that by the time you meet a, a potential investor, they should be begging to invest in you as opposed to the other way around. And this is a very common mistake um, uh, early stage uh, entrepreneurs make, which is they think meeting more investors is more important than preparing in a full-fledged manner. And I have never seen succeeded that because begging, you don't get fundraising because somebody sympathizes with you. The only reason they sympathize with you is because of fear or greed, you know? So they're always saying, oh, am I going to miss out on this amazing deal because this awesome entrepreneur sitting in front of me? Uh, or they're greedy. They're like, oh, you know what? This entrepreneur is only asking me you know, a million dollars at $5 million valuation, they're actually valuable more like, they're more like $10 million value. So they have agreed that they think that they're getting a much better deal than the one you're proposing uh, in their head. Uh, and you're not going to do that. You're not going to make, you're not going to convince the investor based on, as I said, based on sympathy, you know, based on, um, you know, uh, some future promise. Uh, and you're almost never going to, impress them with things like ROI and things like that. Oh, this is your return on investment. If you talk in financial terms, you're never going to win. Uh, the way you're going to win is going to be so prepared. You know, all your, you know, demos are amazing. You have a very rich slide deck. You have a very great executive summary. You have done the exercise I talked about, like resource mapping, problem canvas, solution canvas, findings plot. You have this 20-page document that says, here's all the work after talking to many people you have done. And when you do that and then you meet the investor for the first time, they're just blown away. They're like, whoa, like every question I can ask, this entrepreneur has already thought about. But if 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 the investor feels like, oh, you're just getting started, you know, uh, then of course they're not going to invest. So I, I, in my experience, you know, preparing is so much more important than just doing the investor meetings. So... 
Thank you so much. This is, um, I remember as you were speaking, I remember being on both sides of the table. I managed an investment fund by the eBay founder, uh, Pierre Romidier, and the Brazilian billionaire, Mr. Lemon. And I was on that side of the table. And also as an angel investor, I, sometimes we miss investments. We really want to join the round and the entrepreneur decided not to take us <laughs> with, alongside for the ride. And that was very frustrating. Uh, but, you know, it's a business business, but indeed, like entrepreneurs sometimes think they are, well, they might have a big asset and the investors should really want to be uh, with them. So it's not, we're not begging. Entrepreneurs are not begging for money. It's an, an opportunity for sure yeah, to be yeah, part absolutely. of a great business. Absolutely. Uh, and again, ChatGPT you know, is your friend. You know, you can, you can upload everything and say, hey, here's what we have heard about so far, what's missing in our pitch so far. Uh, or a meeting, you can literally type the name of the investor and you know, copy paste their LinkedIn profile and say, uh, hey, ChatGPT, let me tell you the profile of the investor I'm going to meet. Here's their LinkedIn profile. You have to copy paste it, unfortunately. Uh, given that, what should be my pitch? And you, know, you can get a lot done that way. So Ramesh, I need to confess that uh, one of the questions I asked you today came from ChatGPT, and it was really <laughs> the, the ethics and bias question, actually. Um, it's a really good one. And so I think we have like just a few more minutes and want to ask you more about your current class. Uh, I'm not sure if everybody knows, but Ramesh teaches a class called AI Venture Studio at MIT, and it's, uh, it seems like it's a Sloan Business School joint class with the Media Lab and maybe another apartment as well. Would you like yeah, to tell us more about, so which one is this? Yeah, I'll just share the screen so you can see it. Please. Um, um, yeah, so that's the course, AI Venture Studio. And yeah, it's with MIT Media Lab and MIT CSAIL and LIDS and everybody. Uh, and it's a class that's been going on for quite some time now. They have access to all the links you can, you know, check it out a lot of our materials online um you know we have three professors there you know a lot of vcs are kind of part of the course uh there and uh and yeah we have some of the top people in ai uh as mentors or speakers uh in our course uh so it's a lot of fun uh to uh, to see them uh come here so a lot of a lot of familiar people from top organizations and and, and so on right um, and then we do a lot of socials, you know, um, you know, uh, here you can, you can see this, for example, um, no, it's too late. <laughs> it happened a long time ago. Um, we have a lot of socials. You can, you know, uh, sign up for future updates there and so on. Uh, and at the end of the semester, we also have a, a, a demo day, you know, which is a, just an awesome uh, you know, opportunity to uh, see what's going on. All the all the projects from last year are actually listed here, so you know you can you can you can look at that. So these are the all the all the pictures from. Let's see if I have it. Um, I guess not. Uh, but yeah, all all the pictures are online, so you can look at the video. You can see how they are. Uh, you know they are they are working on this. Uh, and so, yeah, here this is an example of the fourteen or so, sixteen I guess. Um, uh, sorry, yeah, fourteen teams and what kind of areas they are working on uh, in AI, right? And about twenty four percent of these go ahead and raise funds. So a lot of our materials online. You can you can take a look at that. Uh, that's wonderful that you are opening up to the uh, general audience, uh, what's going on at MIT. And I think this has been a practice of yours for a while. So yeah. I think the world uh, uh, probably will thank you for this. Uh, so folks, check out these materials. We, I have just posted a link on the chat. Uh, and Ramesh, are any of the sessions, because I saw a link to uh, signing up for Zoom perhaps, is this... Um, Available for the public or not really? Uh, it the, has the, to be. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, we cannot give access to the live courses, but we have multiple events. And then also we have the final demo day that anybody can log into. That's on December 7th at 10 a.m. So you can, you, can sign up, you can sign up for that here. 
uh, and then you know we'll 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 uh, we will um, you know kind of uh, you'll get an email about where the next event is. Wonderful! I'll be there in this December seventh, ten a.m. Boston time. Is that that's right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. I'm glad it doesn't overlap with our final uh, session, our final pitch day. <laughs> this program it's on Friday, December eighth. So uh, I'm glad we didn't overlap. So folks, just take this opportunity. It's really amazing. And Ramesh, I want to pass on to you for your final words and final recommendations. You gave us so much this today, like in such a brief period of time. And I really appreciated all the questions that came along. And so any advice? And I, I think we have a, a final question from Kristen, perhaps that could be included in this advice. For Kristen Godoy asks about what skill set or career pivots do you recommend picking up to to hedge the risk of knowledge uh, based work displacement or anything related of okay this is the current you you said take the next five years a lot will change so for the folks here innovators entrepreneurs intrapreneurs right. some of them are not technical. Do you have any uh, general advice for those folks on how should they like prepare this next five years or now to not lose this? Or, I mean, take advantage, not even not lose this bandwagon, like just really take advantage of this change. Yeah, I can charge you as your friend. So, you know, I just talk like, how can I harness AI to start a company um, in nursing, right? Give me a business plan, right? This is for Sidalia, I think, right? One yeah. of the first questions we got. So it will tell you everything, right? Um, a whole business plan of how you would use Harness AI in, in nursing, for example, right? So it, it's better than everything, anything I can tell you uh, in that sense. So almost any question you have, uh, you know, you can, you can, it's, it's almost for the business plan for you. So, you know, so this, this creates something generic, right? Uh, in AI, uh, but say, you know, you can just say, write a real business plan for doing this in Boston uh, with numbers, and, and and team and uh, uh, potential uh, so that I can so that I can show it to investors right uh, and sometimes it'll do a pretty good job of um, of, of doing that thinking a lot <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so anyway, the, the, the bigger <laughs> message I'm saying here is that do not hesitate to jump into completely new areas you do not need any technical background uh, to jump into AI, um, I think it's it's you know your curiosity and your 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 perseverance is going to play a much bigger role than your technical skills. Just this morning, I was reading an article that uh, you know ten years ago, about seventy percent of companies had technical co-founders, but now that percentage is close to fifty percent. So the trend is you know non-technical founders have ability to start companies because of no code and low code platforms but it's important for you to still get on a computer and use a no code no code platform uh, to do this you cannot just say hey i'm a non technical founder so all i'm going to do is talk and create powerpoint slides you can't do that looks like it and, got stuck by the way here <laughs> yeah maybe this was uh, too much for chatgpt now uh, so a uh, question for you uh, on like Whatever question, whatever uh, answer you get from ChatGPT, um, how like what do you recommend to not not get falling into a trap of some hallucination of the model and like sometimes the answers can be a bit off. So what do you recommend to send it in um, chat? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think you don't want to rely on that completely, uh, but you know it gives you a you know it'll give you a pretty good outline. It, it'll basically it'll tell you something that's much better than any human expert can tell you, including me, right? So ChatGPT is going to be better than like 95% of human experts you'll meet. Uh, so it's, it, there's no time, you don't have to go and find your favorite uncle or 
if you're a buddy from your college or you know your you know things like that uh, to do this you can you know you charge you produce your new uncle that's, that's wonderful so folks don't hesitate to explore chat gpt and other of those uh, large language models and tools you find that you can get access and and just don't be afraid of it and i i think we have the opportunity here today to learn so much from Ramesh. This will be recorded. I will definitely go back to read more about your frameworks. Um, it reminded me a bit of the uh, ISO OSI right model, the the, the stacks, <laughs> of, yeah. uh, like really amazing. Thinking about the jewelry and not the shovel, uh, all of those lessons that only a person who's been out there for so long and who's has these research perspective, the investment perspective, entrepreneurial perspective, and this whole landscape of right this uh, space that you've been uh, working on for so many years. We really, really appreciate your time today, Ramesh, and thanks everyone to thank you, everyone who are here. So thank you a lot. Thanks a lot. We'll be joining your uh, demo day for sure. And happy to be of help uh, from big thanks from IT Bootcamps, Ramesh. Thank you. It's so good to connect. So you, uh, all the best for you and your adventure journey. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ramesh. Thank you so much, Anna. It's nice to see you all. Uh, we'll be logging off for now, but um, hope to see you all very soon.